in in about a minute. I don't have my teacher voice anymore. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. I think we're ready to get started. <laughs> so good afternoon. Uh, dear students, faculty, staff, parents, and friends of the college, I'm Josh Hagan, Dean of the College of Letters and Science. It is my pleasure and honor to welcome you to our 23rd annual College of Letters and Science Undergraduate Research Symposium. Welcome to both you in person and to those joining us via our live stream. During its 23 year history, over 1,600 students have participated in the symposium. As one of the college's signature events, the symposium provides a vivid, vivid example of collaboration between students, faculty, and staff to advance the mission and vision of the college and university. This year's symposium features approximately 100 student research posters and presentations drawn from across the college's four schools and 13 departments. These presentations and posters highlight the curiosity, dedication, and passion of our students to pursue research and intellectual development in close partnership with faculty mentors as true partners in discovery. Many people have contributed to making this event happen, and I would like to recognize their efforts, beginning with the organizing committee and the college office staff. So as I read your name, if they could please stand to be recognized. From the organizing committee, Tobias Barsky, David Berry, <laughs> Lynn Ludwig, Ken Menigan, and Joe Mondlock. Thank you. And from the college office, Carrie Hutton, Tony Romano, Aaron Schaffenbiel, and Carrie Zolkowski. I would also like to thank Provost Marty Loy and Chancellor Thomas Gibson for their support. And special thanks to State Representative Katrina Shanklin for joining us here this afternoon. I'm not sure if they're quite here yet, but. Okay, great. Um, so we're honored that you uh, took time out of your busy schedule to join us here this afternoon. I would also be remiss if I did not recognize the efforts of our faculty mentors. Their names appear throughout the program. So would all of the faculty mentors please stand. So thank you for inspiring our students. Finally, please join me in congratulating our students for all of their hard work that they have invested to reach to this point. Students, this is your day and you can be proud of your achievements. As Dean, I had the privilege of getting a sneak peek at your research projects as the submissions came in for the symposium and I'm eager to learn more about what you have discovered. So to kick off the symposium, I'm pleased to introduce our opening speakers, Dr. Rob Harper, Professor of History and Coordinator of Native American Studies, and students Dylan Potter and Jarti Bavedo, who will provide an overview of their work involving the Native American burial site on campus. Please join me in welcoming them. Thank you, Dean Hagen. Um, uh, I'm Rob Harper. It's a pleasure to be here today. It's especially a pleasure to be introducing uh, our two fantastic student interns, Dylan and Dorita. 
Uh, I have some uh, important announcements and a whole bunch of thank yous uh, to start out with. Um, first of all, as you may know, uh, tomorrow will be the uh, 50th annual or so uh, powwow uh, led by the American Indians, resist <laughs> American Indians Reaching for Opportunities uh, student organization. Uh, and that is right across the hall in the gym. If at all possible, uh, get over there. It's going to be a fantastic time starting at nine and going all day. So uh, stop by uh, and uh, support our students. Um, also, uh, we have another important event coming up on um, this coming Thursday, May 12th, uh, which will be over in the CBB building. Uh, and that'll be a reception um, That'll feature both um, the work of uh, my students in the Wisconsin Indian History class, History 393, uh, and also the work of the Historical Documentaries class taught by um, Sarah Scripps. And there will also be a reception um, done by the uh, Museum of Natural History. Uh, and so that's another great chance to uh, recognize and, and celebrate our student wor students' work and uh, learn a good deal about uh, a region's history. So, uh, and finally, uh, we now, I'm very pleased to announce after uh, many years of uh, work by me and lots of other people, we are relaunching uh, Native American and in Indigenous Studies on campus as a new certificate program. Um, I could say lots and lots about it, but I mostly just encourage you to uh, let students know about it and uh, put them in touch with me if they have any questions. Uh, it should be in going live in the catalog soon, so uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, this is a project we've been working on, um, meaning me and Jarita and Dylan have been working on for a year or so. Uh, it is a start project that began with the work of Ray Reeser, um, retired from the uh, New University, uh, who did the initial uh, research to have the burial site on campus uh, documented and registered with the state. Um, and uh, so this could not have happened without Ray's work, also could not have happened without the work of Karen Ann Hoffman, who I'm delighted to see here today, and who uh, it was an absolutely critical um, advocate in uh, getting the university to uh, recognize and uh, appropriately uh, acknowledge uh, those burials. Uh, yeah. <laughs> as, a, as a result of Ray and Karen's work, um, Chancellor Gibson convened a commission um, to uh, do a whole bunch of things, including um, deciding, basically bringing um, the descendant communities, representatives of the descendant communities together to talk about how it would be the most appropriate way to uh, commemorate that site, uh, and that work is ongoing. Um, we're not gonna talk much about that today because it's not really in, uh, uh, not really our thing, but um, it's important to uh, know, and I'm really grateful to the co-chairs of the commission, um, Al Thompson and Sky Alloway, who uh, made that happen. Tobias Barsky, our assistant dean, uh, had the vision from the get-go of going beyond simply acknowledging the existence of the burial site on campus and to bring it into connection with research and teaching opportunities, both in terms of teaching our students and reaching out to the broader community. Uh, and so I'm really grateful to him for that. Uh, Sarah Scripps, as a museum director of the Museum of Natural History, has been collaborating with us all the way on this and been a huge help. Uh, Rachel Davis is the new director this semester of the Native American Center on campus, has also been an incredible help. And we've also been working with um, consultants from um, the state's tribal communities and specifically uh, Donald Keeble from the Forest County uh, Potawatomi Cultural Center uh, and uh, Josie Lee from the Ho-Chunk Nation Museum 
uh, Dave Greeno from the uh, Menominee Cultural uh, Center, uh, and um, <laughs> Teresa. Getting Teresa's name from um, Lac de Flambeau um, Museum. So, uh, apologies to Teresa. <laughs> um, and finally, I'm extremely grateful to uh, our interns, uh, Dylan and Jarita, for their um, work. So, I'm going to first, um, and I should say, um, the project has gone through multiple. Uh, iterations and multiple uh, names, and the name we've been working with for a while now is Pasipakinen, which is the uh, Menominee uh, name of Stevens Point, according to uh, the work of um, the late Mike Hoffman, who created the Menominee Place Names Project, which you can find on the UWSB website if you're wondering how to say the names of um, places in Wisconsin in Menominee. That's a wonderful resource that we're very grateful to Mike for. So uh, with that, I'm going to introduce um, Dylan Potter, who's going to talk about the uh, some of the research we've done in terms of awareness. So Dylan, take it away. Hello everyone, my name is Dylan Potter. I am a student here at the College of Letters and Sciences. I'm an English major, and uh, I had the honor to work under Professor Harper on this project, which has been fantastic. Um, so, one of the most important parts of history is that it is ultimately a story, and our job as researchers or historians or a community is to understand that story, is to understand a local story, understand the story of Stevens Point, and of Central Wisconsin, <coughs> And to know that story is as true as we can possibly figure out, right? Truth is very important in stories. Um, so that's what we did. We studied and we worked hard on this. Uh, to start, we had a lot of materials to go through. Um, archival resources, such as microfilms, government documents, plot maps, and boxes of hard copies. We're talking thousands of items. Um, there were some really, really useful documents, some ones that were kind of hard to work with, and some that were uh, not useful at all such as Exhibit 3. <laughs> um, with so much history and resources to go through, one of the first clear steps was to determine what the community um, and college students knew about local Native American history, uh, including the burial site that was covered up on this very campus. Um, to gauge knowledge and interest, we created and used multiple anonymous surveys. Um, some were paper handed out to the community, uh, handed out in classrooms, handed out in different parts of campus. Others were virtual and sent through the message of the day program to students. We received 125 results. Um, this led to some interesting findings. First, the disparity between knowledge and interest. Um, here's a breakdown of results to our first question. And then this pie chart here is the to sum total of all surveys. About 30% of individuals were unaware of a burial site on campus. Um, moving on, we asked in a short question for individuals to briefly share what they knew about Native American communities. And uh, the number one response was that they had little to no knowledge, they didn't know very much, they weren't really sure. Um, so I kind of lumped it all together in little to no knowledge, which made up 39.2% of all responses. Um, the second most received response was left blank. And the final one was that they could name different local communities. An example was Nom Menominee and Ho-Chunk. Um, together, these three results made up about 90% of our results. Um, so there was not a lot of knowledge going around or a lot of knowledge being shared. Um, then we asked, would you be interested in seeing the creation of an exhibit related to Native American history and culture at the museum? Um, 125 responses uh, is a pretty simple number. No one had said no. There was 121 <laughs> yeses, and four individuals were unsure. But overall, it's, it's very clear evidence. Uh, then we requested short answer responses to see what kind of uh, knowledge individuals would want to see. And we received, in true testament to human creativity, 125 different responses. <laughs> So I, uh, 
I couldn't find a way to show them in a clear, easy, concise way. So I put them all into a word cloud and picked out the most commonly used phrases. Uh, here you can read their very into Native American art, culture, history, areas involving Stevens Point, Central Wisconsin. Um, there's a lot of interest in this project. So that's all I have for you. Thank you. Thank you, Dylan. Um, now is where uh, Jarita and I will start uh, talking history. So if you, if you absolutely dreaded your high school history classes, well, now <laughs> you're, you've been warned. Um, yeah, so this is um, uh, so much to say here, so little time. And so I'm going to, as those of you who know me, are aware being concise is not my strong suit, so I'm working against uh, trend here. Um, this is a uh, widely uh, distributed map. I see this a fair amount in different places. It's an important map. Uh, it's, um, the title is not always included. The original map it's taken from is entitled Treaty Lands. Uh, and it's an important map for indicating uh, which lands in uh, Wisconsin and surrounding area were ceded by which native nations uh, to the United States uh, and indicates if uh, you know, we are, where did this go? Do we have a pointer? Maybe we don't have a pointer. Anyway, we're up there near where that spike, brown spike goes up, which is the Wisconsin River. Uh, and um, so on territory ceded by the Menominee, um, closely adjacent to territory ceded by the Ho-Chunk and Ojibwe. But this map is also profoundly misleading because it is uh, the US government's view of the space. This is um, one of the first things the US government does when it starts uh, talking to these nations is trying to specify boundaries and have each group assigned a particular set of lines in which their territory is. And this is important to the US government because it's the prerequisite for creating a paper trail for acquiring that land for the United States. Uh, and it creates the impression of walls, of boundaries of the kind we imagine today between uh, different nations where there are border posts and things like that. Uh, when in reality, if we think of the history of a place like Stevens Point, this is a place that is historically Menominee land and historically Ho-Chunk land, but of all, above all, it is a place of connection. It is a place of communication. And this becomes especially clear if we just take all of the government's defined lines away and just look at the rivers. So, um, the, uh, you can see Stevens Point right there in the middle. The most important place in early Wisconsin, arguably, is Portage right there, which is the shortest, uh, shortest overland journey between the Wisconsin River watershed, which connects to the Mississippi and the Gulf of Mexico, and the Fox River, which connects to the Great Lakes and the Atlantic Ocean. So for purposes of trade crossing over thousands of miles, um, Portage turns out to be a linchpin. Um, but Stevens Point is also a crucial point for trade and communication. Uh, it was known as the um, site of the Plover Portage, uh, referring to the Plover River, uh, which um, if you <coughs> basically the line going up through Stevens Point at about 1 o'clock, um, there and there's about a 15 mile or so walk between the Plover River and the uh, Tomorrow River, which flows into the Wolf, which flows into uh, the Fox, ultimately Green Bay. And so, uh, and then on the other side of Stevens Point, we've got the um, Eau Plaine River, the big and little Eau Plaine Rivers heading west. So this is both a site for north-south travel um, through the the, the the Wisconsin River is a thoroughfare for uh, water transportation, uh, basically right up until the era of uh, railroads and beyond. Um, 
but also east-west connections through these portages and smaller streams. So this is a place where Ho-Chunk and Menominee people have lived. It's also a place where Ojibwe and Potawatomi people and members of many other nations have been traveling, passing through, trading, conducting diplomacy, getting married, having families, whole long list of um, interactions and connections. So when we think of the indigenous history of Stevens Point, this is not just a matter of thinking of it as the territory of a particular group of people. This is also a linchpin in networks of trade that ultimately over by canoe traveling on these rivers uh, would extend hundreds if not a thousand miles in just about every direction. Um, so that first point is about connections. This next point is about trauma and ethnic cleansing. I'm going to be focusing here mainly on the Potawatomi and Ho-Chunk uh, peoples because for the period of time we're talking about uh, in the burial site, uh, they're the people who are most frequently in and around Stevens Point. And the simple story here is that the United States uh, moves around Ho-Chunk and Potawatomi people um, repeatedly over the course of decades, um, generally unwillingly, sometimes often um, at gunpoint, often under terrible conditions that lead to lots of deaths. And um, Dorita is going to uh, have a bit more to say about that. Um, both of these nations um, conduct dozens of treaties with the United States. The United States, by and large, does not uh, uphold the terms of those treaties. Uh, it's, um, it is a mess. Here's the um, Potawatomi pattern of removals. And again, you'll see uh, historic Potawatomi uh, territory all the way around um, Lake Michigan. And in the removal area, you have Potawatomi people being forced to march all the way into um, Kansas, ultimately Oklahoma. Some end up down in Mexico um, because they're getting away from the United States. Lots more head up into Canada. Um, so this is a time of great displacement, great trauma. Uh, it's also a time of return because in both cases, there are a good number of Ho-Chunk and Potawatomi people who managed to avoid getting removed in the first place, and there are lots more who will come back um, repeatedly over the course of these decades. Uh, so here's um, 1856 map of Wisconsin um, showing on the right hand Potawatomi communities of the uh, 1850s where Potawatomi people have come back or stayed. The blue triangles indicate some of the major Ho-Chunk um, sites. Uh, in 1862, there is a war uh, in Minnesota between the, uh, some of the Dakota people and the United States. The effects of that war carry over into Wisconsin um, because they lead to violence and displacement of Ho-Chunk and Potawatomi people who have nothing to do with that particular war. One consequence of that is lots more Ho-Chunk people returning from the West and um, also Potawatomi people being pushed out of homes further east and they end up right in this neck of the woods. Uh, and that leads us to 1863, Stevens Point, uh, the Wisconsin Pinery newspaper, announces a thousand Indians in town, great excitement. Uh, and so the initial newspaper article, and this is based on Ray Reeser's research, by the way, uh, documents all of this uh, excitement. And then a week later, the tone of the newspaper coverage has changed. Um, there are several hundred. Uh, these are strange. They have no legitimate um, business here, ought to be removed, and then ultimately a company of guards is being raised uh, to drive them out. Um, and uh, the uh, Potawatomi in particular are going to end up living for a number of years just over county line in Wapaka County. So 
Um, at this point, I'm going to introduce Jarita, who is going to take you through uh, subsequent coaching. Okay, well that's a lot to follow, so um, I'll just get started. Um, like Dr. Harper said, Stevens Point has long been a crossroads of cultural exchange. Um, it's on the borderlands of the traditional um, homes of the Potawatomi, well not the Potawatomi, sorry, of the Ho-Chunk, of the Ojibwe, of the Menominee. There's this great mixing that happens here. It's always been a place of shared community and life. There's abundant wetlands. There's wild game. There's towering forests of maple and pine that we all love today. Those things were there then, too. And all kinds of people stopped here. Like he said, north, south, east, west. It was a linchpin in a smaller way than the portage. Um, my research for this project really focused on the Ho-Chunk from 1873 to 1894. Um, as Dr. Harper referenced, in the winter of 1873, U.S. government troops rounded up Ho-Chunk people all over southern Wisconsin in Portage and um, places near Toma, rounded them up, loaded them on unheated boxcars, and sent them to Nebraska. And um, they, in Nebraska, um, they had a terrible time. Many of them died, 240 people. Um, and one of the leaders of the Ho-Chunk was named Big Hawk, and he wrote letters publicizing these awful conditions um, back here in Wisconsin and basically would not rest until he came back. So four months and 11 days after his removal, he says he came back to Wisconsin. Um, and once they had returned, their main strategy for remaining in Wisconsin without being removed again was to claim homesteads. And so uh, Big Hawk selected 40 acres on Pike Lake, which is just about, I don't know, 25 mm -hmm. minutes, miles up the Plover River. Um, and that was the beginning of the Wittenberg Ho-Chunk community that you may be familiar with today. Um, after 1875's poor cranberry harvest, Dr. Harper just talked about people being driven out in 1863. Well, fast forward 12 years, um, 800 Ho-Chunk people came to Stevens Point um, and were camping here. And they were also driven out of town. And they ended up going up the Plover River to Big Hawk's land. And in spite of all of that turmoil and the way Stevens Point was not a welcoming place for indigenous people at that time, they still continued to camp here, to come back here, to hold dances, to trade. And their, one of their primary campsites was the land where we're standing today. Um, and there was, it's often mentioned that there's a jack pine grove here um, where people were buried. And so it's just, this truly is a place of deep history. Um, another reason that they constantly visited Stevens Point in spite of the tre their treatment was because of an elderly woman. And it's very rare to see women in this history, so I was very excited. Um, her name is Julia Greeno Mayron. She was 70 years old. She was of Ho-Chunk and French descent belonging to the influential Decora family. And she was a very generous and caring person, known to give the clothes off her back and her last loaf of bread to Ho-Chunk people in need. And so she interpreted for Ho-Chunk people in lots of high stakes situations, from annuity payments to land disputes to court cases. And she bridged cultures, French, Ho-Chunk, and Anglo, in her role as a public mother, where she provided charity and hospitality, promoted peace and diplomacy, and truly benefited the whole community. Um, only a couple of seconds left. So Stevens Point, though, was still a dangerous place for indigenous people and especially for women. Um, the main thing that I've been looking at is in February of 1886 in what is now Park Ridge, where I live, white men sexually assaulted two Ho-Chunk women and murdered one of them. White people ignored this story. Um, but the Wittenberg Ho-Chunk were like, no. You are not going to forget that easily. And so Big Hawk and members of his band paid an attorney to prosecute the case. Eight Ho-Chunk witnesses came down from Pike Lake to testify, but the county judge dismissed the case, and the perpetrators were never punished. Um, after this miscarriage of justice, um, we see Big Hawk spending less time in Stevens Point, and he started focusing on advocacy to keep Ho-Chunk children out of the um, school in, at Bethany Indian Mission in Wittenberg. 
Um, so although my research focused on the Ho-Chunk and UWSP's beginnings, I just want to recognize that there are many other indigenous people who have left an indelible and wonderful mark on UWSP, from Dorothy Davids, a Stockbridge Muncie Mohican educator, who was our, the first native person to graduate here 51 years after um, Old Main was built. Um, in the 1960s, the student activists who brought us Arrow, um, American Indians reaching for opportunities. And in the 1970s, the, in a like, beautiful thing, I don't know, the offices of the Wisconsin Winnebago Business Committee were actually in Old Main and Nelson Hall. Um, then of course the Native American Center began in 1978 and what the week that we're in the middle of right now, Native American Awareness Week has been going for 50 years, highlighting the history and continued presence of Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Potawatomi, Stockbridge, Muncie, Oneida, and Ojibwe people on our campus and in Wisconsin. So, thank you. Thank you, thank you all very, very much. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work this year. It's, it's been a challenge to squeeze it all into a limited time frame. Um, uh, if any, I know we're, we're short on time here. If any of you have uh, questions, want to know more, um, please come and um, talk to us. And Jarita has a research poster on the wall over on that side by the elevator. So if you want to find out more, you can go talk to her there as well uh, during the uh, poster session. Um, any uh, questions, comments at this point? I am going to make a comment. And I am here to say that it's possible Keenan. And possible Keenan is it juts out into the water like a point of land. It juts out into the water like a point of land. And that is with the Menominee who have been here for 14,000 years, know this place to be. There was a lot of really good information today and I'm delighted to see this topic of conversation come forward because we've been erased for a very long time. But I would encourage you to not let the notion that the Menominee the Omatnamanewa, who never are among the only Indian people in that Turtle Island, who never were removed from their homelands. Don't let that lack of documentation by the federal government, their lack of success in removing the Omatnamane, don't let that trick you into thinking that they weren't here. The people who lose in their borders, the Wachunga, the Bodhwadne, they lost to the federal government. And those victories over the Indians are well documented and provide the source material for your investigations. I encourage you, and I know that Dr. Harper does as well, first person sources are what are missing in so much of academic work today, in my opinion. So well done. Don't just rely on the documentation left behind by the victorious side. Go to the first person survivors and ask them, why are they missing from the recorded history? Well done.